Live from San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering DataWorks Summit 2017. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Welcome back to theCUBE. I'm Lisa Martin with my co-host George Gilbert. We are live on day one of the DataWorks Summit in San Jose in the heart of Silicon Valley. Great uh, buzz and the event that I'm sure you can see in here behind us. We're very excited to be joined by a couple of fellows from IBM, um, a very long-standing Hortonworks partner that announced a phenomenal suite of four new levels of the partnership today. Please welcome Asad Mahmoud, Analytics Cloud Solutions Specialist at IBM and Medical Doctor, and Linton Ward, Distinguished Engineer, Power Systems Open Power Solution from IBM. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Great Welcome to here. have you both on theCUBE for the first time. So, Linton, software has been changing. Uh, Companies, enterprises all around are really looking for more open solutions, really moving away from proprietary. Talk to us about the Open Power Foundation before we get into uh, the announcements today. Um, what was the genesis of that? Okay, sure. We recognize the need for innovation beyond a single chip uh, to build out an ecosystem uh, and innovation collaboration with our system partners. So ranging from Google to Mellanox for networking, to Hortonworks for software, we believe that that system level optimization and innovation is what's going to bring the price performance advantage in the future. That traditional CMOS scaling doesn't really bring us there by itself, but that partnership does. So from today's announcements, a number of announcements that Hortonworks is adopting IBM's um, data science platform. So really, the theme this morning of the keynote was data science, right? It's the, the next leg and really transforming an enterprise to be very much data driven and digitalized. Uh, we also saw um, the announcement about Atlas for data governance. What does that mean from your perspective um, on the engineering side? Uh, very exciting, you know, in terms of building out solutions of hardware and software, uh, the ability to really harden the, the, the Hortonworks data platform with servers and storage and networking, um, I think it's going to bring uh, simplification to on-premise, as like people are seeing with the cloud. I think the ability to create the, the analyst workbench or the cognitive workbench using the data science experience uh, to create a pipeline of, of data flow and analytic flow, I think is going to be very strong for, uh, for innovation. Uh, around that, most notable for me is the fact that they're all built on open technologies, leveraging com uh, communities uh, that universities can pick up, contribute to, uh, I think we're going to see the pace of innovation really pick up. And on that front, on pace of innovation, you talked about universities. One of the things I thought was really um, a great um, highlight in the customer panel this morning that Raj Verma hosted was you had healthcare, insurance companies, financial services, there was Duke Energy there, and they all talked right. about kind of in the, one of the great benefits of open source is that uh, kids in, in universities have access to the software for free. So from a talent um, yes. attraction perspective, they're really kind of fostering that next generation who will be able to take this to the next level, which I think is a really important point as we look at data science being kind of the next big um, driver, transformer, and also going, you know, there's not a lot of really skilled data scientists. How can that, how can that change? Uh, over time, and this is one, the open source community that Hortonworks has been very dedicated to since the beginning, is a great, um, it's really a great outcome of that. Definitely, I think the, uh, the ability to take the risk out of a new analytic pro, uh, project is one benefit, and the other benefit is uh, there's a tremendous, not just from young people, a tremendous amount of interest among programmers, developers of all types to, to create uh, data science skills, uh, data engineering and data science skills. If we, if we leave aside the skills for a moment and focus on the sort of the operationalization of the models once they're built, how should we, how should we think about um, a trained model, um, or I should break it into two pieces, how should we think about training the models, where the data comes from and who does it, and then the orchestration and deployment of them, cloud, um, edge gateway, edge device, that sort of thing. I think it all comes down to 
exactly what your use case is. You have to identify what use case you're trying to tackle, whether that's applicable to clinical medicine, whether that's applicable to finance, to banking, to retail transportation. First, you have to have that use case in mind. Then you can go about training that model, developing that model. And for that, you need to have a good, potent, robust data set to allow you to carry out that analysis. And whether you want to do exploratory analysis or you want to do predictive analysis, that needs to be very well defined in the training stage. Once you have that model developed, then we have certain services such as Watson Machine Learning within Data Science Experience that will allow you to take that model that you just developed just moments ago and just deploy that as a RESTful API that you can then embed into an application, into your solution. And then that solution you can basically use across industry. Are there, are there some uh, use cases where you have almost like a a tier, a tiering of models where, you know, there's some that are right at the edge, like you know, a big device like a car, um, and then you know, there's sort of the fog level, which is the, uh, which is the, um, say, cell towers or, you know, other buildings nearby, mm -hmm. and then there's something in the cloud that's sort of like master model or an ensemble of models. Exactly. How, I, you know, I don't. I don't assume that's like like evil Knievel would say. You know, don't try that at home. <laughs> but sort of, are, is the tooling being built to enable that? So the tooling is already in existence right now. You can actually go ahead right now and be able to build up prototypes, even full level, full range applications right on the cloud, and you can do that. You can do that thanks to data science experience, you can do that thanks to IBM Lumix. You can go ahead and do that type of analysis right there. And then not only that, you can allow that analysis to actually guide you along the path from building a model to building a full range application. And this is all happening on the cloud level. We can talk more about it happening on the on-premise level, but on the cloud level specifically, you can have those applications built on the fly, on the cloud, and have them deployed for web apps, for mobile apps, et cetera. One of the things that you talked about is um, use cases in, in certain verticals, and IBM is, has been very strong and vertically focused for a very long time. But you kind of almost answered the question, but I'd like to maybe explore a little bit more about sure. building these models, training the models in, say, healthcare or telco, and then being able to deploy them. Where's the horizontal benefits there that, that IBM would be able to deliver faster to other industries? Definitely. I think the main thing is that IBM, first of all, gives you that opportunity, that platform to say that, hey, okay, you have a data set, you have a use case, let's give you the tooling, let's give you the methodology to take you from data to a model to ultimately that full range application. And specifically, I've built some applications specific to federal healthcare, specifically to address uh, clinical medicine and behavioral medicine, and that's allowed me to actually use IBM tools and some open source technologies as well to actually go out and build these applications on the fly as a prototype to show not only the realm, the art of the possible when it comes to these technologies, but also to solve problems, because ultimately that's what we're trying to accomplish here. We're trying to find real world solutions to real world problems. Linton, let me, let me redirect something towards you about, um, a lot of people are talking about how Moore's Law is slowing down or even en ending, well, at least in terms of s speed of processors. But if, if you look at the, um, not just the CPU, but uh, FPGA or ASIC or, or, or the Tensor Processing Unit, which I assume mm -hmm. is an ASIC, um, and you have the high-speed interconnects. If we don't look at just, you know, what can you fit on one chip, but you look at, you know, 3D, what's the density of transistors, you know, in a rack or in a data center, is that still growing as fast or faster? And, and what does it mean for the types of models that we can build? Well, that's, uh, that's a great question. The, one of the key things that we did with the Open Power Foundation is to open up the interfaces to the chip. So with NVIDIA, we have NVLink, which gives us a, a substantial increase in bandwidth. Uh, we have created something called OpenCAPI, which is a coherent protocol to get to other types of accelerators. So we believe that hybrid computing in that form, uh, you saw NVIDIA on stage uh, this morning, and uh, we believe, especially for deep learning, the, the uh, acceleration provided from GPUs is going to continue to drive uh, substantial growth. It's a very exciting time. Would it, would it be fair to say that um, we're, we're on the same curve, not, uh, uh, if we look at it not from the point of view of you know what can we fit on a little square, 
but if we look at it, what can we fit in a you know a data center or the power available to, to model things. You know, Jeff Dean at um, Google said, hey, if Android users talk into their phones for two or three minutes a day, we need two to three times the data centers we have. What's the, um, what can we grow that, you know, price performance faster and enable sort of things that we did not expect? I think, I, I think the innovation that you're describing will in fact uh, put pressure on data centers. Uh, the ability to collect uh, data from autonomous vehicles or other uh, endpoints is, is really going up. Uh, we will have, uh, so we're okay for the near term, but at some point we will have to start looking at other technologies uh, to continue that growth. Uh, right now we're in the throes of uh, what I call fast data versus slow data, so keeping the slow data cheaply and getting the fast data closer to the compute is a, is a very big deal for us. So NAND flash and other non-volatile technologies for the fast data uh, are where the innovation is happening right now. But you're right, over time, we will continue to collect more and more data and it will put pressure on the overall technologies. Last question as we get ready to wrap here. Asad, your background is, is fascinating to me. Having a, a medical degree and, and working in federal healthcare right. for IBM, you talked about some of the, the, the clinical work that you're doing exactly. and, and the models that you're helping to build. What are some of the mission critical needs that you're seeing in healthcare today that are really kind of driving not just healthcare organizations to do big data right, but to do data science right? Exactly. So I think one of the biggest questions that we get and one of the biggest needs that we get from the healthcare arena is patient-centric solutions. There are a lot of solutions that are help to, uh, helping to address uh, so, uh, problems that are being faced by physicians on a day-to-day -day level, but there are not enough applications that are addressing the concerns that are or the pain points that patients are facing on a daily basis. So the applications that I've started building out at IBM are all patient-centric applications that basically put the level of their data, their symptoms, their diagnosis in their hands alone and allows them to actually find out, okay, more or less what's going on wrong with my body at any particular time during the day and then find the right healthcare professional, the right doctor that's best suited to treating that condition, treating that diagnosis. So I think that's the big thing that we've seen from the healthcare uh, market right now. The big need that we have that we're currently addressing with our cloud analytics technology, which is just becoming more and more advanced and sophisticated and it's trending towards more of some of the other uh, health trends or technology trends that we have currently right now on the market, including the blockchain, which is tending towards more of a decentralized focus on these applications. So it's actually putting more of the data in the hands of the consumer, of the hands of the patient, and even in the hands of the doctor. Wow, fantastic. Well you guys, thank you so much for joining us on theCUBE. Uh, congratulations on your first time being on the show, Thank Asad you. Mahmood and Linton Ward from IBM. We appreciate your time. Thank you very Thank much. You. And Pleasure. for my co-host, George Gilbert, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE live on day one of the DataWorks Summit from Silicon Valley, but stick around. We've got great guests coming up, so we'll be right back.